On a summer day in 1944, the soldiers came. Nobody lives here now. They stayed only a few hours. When they had gone, a community which had lived for a thousand years was dead. This is Oradour sur Glane in France. The day the soldiers came, the people were gathered together. The men were taken to garages and barns. The women and children were led down this road and they were driven into this church. Here they heard the firing as their men were shot. Then they were killed too. A few weeks later many of those who had done the killing were themselves dead in battle. They never rebuilt Oradour. Its ruins are a memorial. Its martyrdom stands for thousand upon thousand of other martyrdoms in Poland, in Russia, in Burma, in China, in a world at war. Germany in 1933. A huge, blind excitement fills the streets. The National Socialists have come to power in a land tortured by unemployment, embittered by loss of territory, demoralized by political weakness. Perhaps this will be the new beginning. Most people think the Nazis a little absurd here, too obsessive there. But perhaps the time for thinking is over. Adolf Hitler did not seize power. He was offered it just as his voting strength was declining. The politicians who made Hitler chancellor argued, we are hiring him. Their figurehead was the ancient president von Hindenburg. Communists and socialists tried to take Hitler coolly. This wouldn't last, they said. Conservative anti-Nazis took comfort from the fact that their old war leader Hindenburg, still head of state, was known to despise the vulgar little corporal. With mock solemnity, Hitler and his lieutenants walked to the ceremonial opening of Parliament. The party's strength had been built up by revolutionary violence. They had never imagined that they could take office legally. When the old Reichstag building was mysteriously gutted by fire, Hitler seized his chance to suspend all civil liberties. His followers could hardly believe their luck. The old Hindenburg, the symbol of apparent continuity, 
presided as they turned office into power by acts of sham legality. In March, when the Reichstag voted to allow Hitler to govern without parliament, Hindenburg made no comment. The legal chancellor marched irresistibly into the role of the legal dictator. Hitler proclaimed the new Germany and meant it to last a thousand years. The new Germany began to round up its enemies. Communists, socialists, impertinent journalists, even Reichstag deputies. At Oranienburg concentration camp just north of Berlin, conditions were at first crude rather than brutal. At this time, the camps were run by the Sturmabteilungen, the SR. They bullied more than they murdered. From the first moment, Hitler unleashed his promised campaign against the Jews. The SR organized boycotts of Jewish-owned shops. The real point was to encourage the German people to think and act anti-Semitic as a matter of course. The outside world was horrified. But there were those, including many German Jews, who thought the anti-Jewish campaign the work of Nazi extremists, something Herr Hitler would put a stop to when he felt more secure. There was to be a cultural revolution too. German culture would be purged of the Jewish Bolshevist taint. The books flew into the fire. Many of those who flung them were students and teachers. And as the sparks rose, the intellectuals fled, writers and scientists, to give their talents to Western Europe and America. A hundred years before, the German Jewish poet Heine, whose books now went into the fire, had warned, where one burns books, there one eventually burns people. Some of Hitler's most earnest followers found new ways to show loyalty. They married or got married all over again under a Nazi ritual. The Nazis had mass support among the unemployed but less among the organized workers. The left wing of the party wanted to start a workers' movement inside the factories, but Hitler took a simpler course. He granted the unions the May Day holiday they had always demanded. Next day, he abolished the unions. Nazi supporters were basically middle class, shopkeepers ruined by the Depression. Clerks who had lost their savings, craftsmen squeezed out by mass production. These were Hitler's worshippers. To this army of those who had come down in the world belonged the small farmers, the peasants. Hitler had enlisted them during the Depression. Now he told them that their blood and their soil were Germany's treasure. He passed laws to give them safe possession of their fields, and he gave them bread. Treaty of Versailles in 1919 
had bitten deep into Germany's frontiers. Alsace-Lorraine and the Saarland had been lost. East Prussia was cut off by the new Polish state. Silesia cut in two. Danzig, a League of Nations city. To every patriot, Germany could not be free while Versailles stood. Hitler alone seemed the savior foretold by the monuments of the border. Never, German, forget what blind hate stole from thee. Wait for the hour that avenges the bleeding frontier crime. Abroad, there were some who admired the way this new Germany stood up for herself. In America, we've had many reports against your new government, and in most cases, this has caused hasty demonstrations everywhere. I can now say to you that the American people today realize that these stories are untrue and without foundation. I find that there's a new, fresh vitality here in Germany under your great leader and chancellor, Adolf Hitler, of whom I'm a great admirer. The new Germany will live, for you have the best centralized government in the world today. In fact, the new Germany was a bundle of different interests and grievances held together by the strap of the National Socialist Party. And the buckle of the strap was Hitler. Der kostbarste Besitz auf dieser Welt aber ist das eigene Volk. Und für dieses Volk und um dieses Volk wollen wir regen und wollen wir kämpfen und niemals erlahmen und niemals ermüden und niemals verzagen und niemals verzweifeln. Es lebe! Well, really, it was the only party that promised to get us out of the hole. And their idea was principally that uh, that was only, would only be possible if we developed as a nation a team spirit, a solidarity, and uh, pulling all on the same rope instead of quarreling about petty differences of opinions in foreign politics and uh, social politics and so on and so forth. Was hat er versprochen? Den damals What did he promise? Work and bread for the masses, for the millions of workers who were unemployed and hungry at that time. Nowadays, in our prosperous society, Work and bread doesn't mean anything anymore. But then it was an absolutely basic need. And this promise, which wouldn't make any sense today, then, then it sounded like a promise of paradise. All this seemed ideal ground for a prophet to say, I will lead you to the promised land. I will deliver you from evil. Anyone who said that would be greeted with enthusiasm. Mit großer Freude zu begrüßen. Es gab natürlich auch Leute, die gesagt haben, das ist ein falscher Prophet. Of course, there were people who said this is a false prophet. But who was to know whether they were right or not? At that time, no one did. Christmas 1933, one year of Hitler's Reich. Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. The concentration camps were full, parliament a rubber stamp, political parties and trade unions abolished, the Jews out of the civil service, a free press strangled, personal liberties destroyed. Germany lived under a permanent state of emergency. Adolf Hitler's state was all-powerful, even almighty.
but he still felt threatened. He feared his old conservative rivals. He feared the army. And he feared those sections of his own party which were still revolutionary, like the leadership of the stormtroopers. The army, too, hated the SR. Hitler saw how he could conciliate the generals and clear his own path. The head of the SR was one of his oldest comrades, Ernst Röhm. On June the 30th, 1934, Röhm was arrested and shot. His SR commanders and more than a hundred others dragged from their beds were shot too. Murder exploded across Germany. The killers were the new force in Germany, the SS, Hitler's bodyguard, which now became his personal instrument of terror. Goering gave a, a press conference at the propaganda ministry. Uh, Goebbels was the minister of propaganda, but Goebbels had wisely stayed with Hitler at that time because Goering hated his guts might have taken the opportunity to bump him off if he'd been in Berlin. Um, Goering uh, had that press conference for the foreign press. Before that, the telephones had been cut off to all foreign countries. Goering came striding in and said, well, I know you boys always like to have a story. And he used the English word. I've got a story for you all right. Um, and described how uh, that previous night and that morning uh, he and Hitler had acted against uh, dissident forces, both uh, of the right uh, and of the left, um, that uh, Rome had been shot, that a second revolution had been quashed. And he also made um, a rather obscure reference to um, General von Schleicher, uh, who had uh, preceded Hitler as uh, German Chancellor. Then he left the room, came back again in a few seconds, and said, um, it's been suggested to me that I didn't make myself quite clear about General von Schleicher. General von Schleicher was shot dead this morning while resisting arrest. The 30th of June, 34, was a very, very important day because it became obvious that this government, as a government, started to become a murderer. You remember that they shot a great number of people without any bringing them to court. They just killed them. And not only um, direct enemies of Hitler in that moment, not only uh, Röhm, the head of the SR, but also other people who were, they felt were unpleasant. And they just did it at the same time. That summer, another rival disappeared. President Hindenburg died in his bed on August the 2nd. While the old man was still breathing, Hitler had abolished the office of president, proclaiming himself Führer and Chancellor, head of state and government. And before his corpse was laid to rest, Hitler usurped his command over the army. The armed forces paraded to swear a new oath, where once they had sworn loyalty to the constitution, now they pledged themselves to Hitler, personally, by name. Ich schwöre bei Gott, ich schwöre bei Gott, diesen heiligen Eid, diesen heiligen Eid, dass ich dem Führer des Deutschen Reiches und Volkes, dem Führer des Deutschen Reiches und Volkes, Adolf Hitler, Adolf Hitler, for German officers, an oath was almost physically real. Hitler had trapped them. Now they could not disobey him without disobeying the fatherland. I swear, I swear by God, I swear by God, I swear by God. 
Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler. Hitler kept up the pace. That same month, the Germans had to go again to the polls to approve his assumption of state and government powers. By now, the machinery of ballot management by threat, propaganda, forgery and fraud was functioning excellently. Hitler had a 90% ja. Four million still voted nine. Hitler proclaimed, for the next thousand years, there will be no other revolution in Germany. The Nazis preached the doctrine of folk community, of learning to be Germans one of another. Winter help, the main street collection for charity, was one symbol. And the leaders of the party, for the benefit of the cameras, showed themselves as folk comrades, too. Goering displayed himself. A war hero, a man who laughed and enjoyed life. A moderating force in the party, it was believed. Josef Goebbels, the little propaganda minister, whom the back street called Poison Dwarf. His sharpness was feared, but respected. The deputy Führer Rudolf Hess, a puzzling figure to the crowds. The Nazi way of ruling was to be remote, but to seem not to be. All classes were encouraged to relish the same meal. The soldier, the boss, the worker, the banker. The party believed in community, but the industrialists stayed rich. They had financed the Nazis when they seemed likely to win, and now they submitted to Nazi direction without too much distaste. Business was picking up fast. The economy was reviving when the Nazis came to power, but they reaped the credit, speeding recovery with an enormous public works program for the unemployed. Other nations where mass unemployment persisted watched Germany with envy. Und jetzt noch einen Augenblick, meine Damen und Herren, etwas zu Ihrer Allgemeinbildung. Es waren an Arbeiten und Angestellten Ende Januar 1933 beschäftigt 11,55 Millionen, Ende Januar 1936 15,70 Millionen und das hat der Führer alles geschafft. Mehr brauchen Sie für heute nicht zu wissen. Workless built the autobahns, the first motorways in the world, binding a still provincial Germany together. The autobahns were not least for private pleasure in the fascist notion of strength through joy. And they were presented less as a transport system than as a triumph of national will, linked with other prestige projects like the design for the Führer's new Berlin. und Gesundheit, gläubig und ihrer großen Pflichten und Aufgaben bewusst, sind sie glückliche Mädel unserer großen Zeit. These were members of Faith and Beauty, which was elder sister to the League of German Maidens, which was the girls' equivalent of the Hitler Youth, and so on. All young people learned party songs, drilled and danced and belonged. Each year, the farmers and their wives gathered at the Buchberg to meet their Führer at harvest time. In 1936, those who stood and waited for the leader numbered one million. The leader was late. He always arrived late. Built up tension.
came, letting the excitement spill over. As he marched through to the rostrum, the masses were allowed to see him close and even to touch him. Deliberately, women were placed in the front rows. When he went up the mountain, I couldn't understand how it was possible that people could shout so much. Yet when he came towards our group, I too came under his spell and shouted Heil just like everyone else. But then, when he was really close, greeting people to his left and right, shaking their hand and exchanging a few words, and he also shook my hand, I suddenly noticed that everybody in his immediate presence was completely silent. For the first ten minutes, he wasn't a good speaker. He just began warming up and finding the words. Uh, but then uh, he turned out to be a terribly good speaker, you know. He, he just, uh, I don't know the words in English, amassiert his public. He, <coughs> and uh, the, uh, the whole atmosphere grew more and more hysterical. Uh, he was uh, interrupted uh, uh, nearly after every phrase uh, by big applause and uh, women began screaming. It, it uh, was like, uh, like a mass religious uh, uh, ceremony. And, uh, well, I listened to his speech and I feel that more and more excited atmosphere in the hall and for some uh, seconds again and again I had a feeling what a pity that I can't share that belief of all those thousands of people that I am alone that I am uh, contrary to all that it was very funny I I thought, well, he is talking all the nonsense I know, the nonsense he always talked. <laughs> but uh, still, uh, I feel it must be wonderful just to jump into that bubbling uh, pot uh, and, and be a member of all those who are believers. lady in our village, she went to Berlin to a birthday reception for Adolf Hitler and she came back and told us the Fuhrer shook hands with me and from this time on she was like a saint in our village. An schroffen Felsenwänden blüht die Blume seltener Art. Hitler's home life took place on a ledge in Bavaria at Berchtesgaden. These pictures are from the home movies of Eva Braun, the discreet young woman who stayed with him till his death. To the Berghof for tea and tactics came the elect, some a little ill at ease, some genuinely intimate. Adolf Hitler's Lieblingsblume ist das schlichte Edelweiß. Adolf Hitler's Lieblingsblume ist das schlichte Even in private, Hitler had to correspond to the image sold to the public. Adolf with children. Adolf with dogs. Adolf with a magnifying glass. 
um das ganze Erden rund. Adolf with friends. Out for a walk, like a good Bavarian bourgeois on a Sunday. Adolf Hitler's Lieblingsblume is... In this closed circle, Eva Brown posed herself as the girl who was natural, healthy, joyfully physical. Hitler's Lieblingsblume is das Schlichte Hitler's Lieblingsblume ist das Schlichte Up at the Berghof, there were jovial, friendly bodyguards and colder ones. Heinrich Himmler, Lord of the SS, came with Heidrich, his terrible, handsome lieutenant. On formal occasions, the SS Guard turned out. They were the reality of the great tyranny centered in distant Berlin, their hands soon to be red with the blood of millions. For that reality, Hitler would leave his chintz chair, his tea parties, and his mistress. The car was waiting at the foot of the steps. Germany was to be strong again. Germany must rearm. A people frightened by war had to become once more familiar with arms. To touch them. To play at soldiers. Germany had to train pilots. Versailles forbade Germany an air force, so the League for Air Sports used gliders to train men, still officially civilians, for the future Luftwaffe. And the army began to swell beyond the limits set by Versailles from the moment Hitler became chancellor. In secret, it trebled its strength in two years. Any foreign military attaché could see what was happening. But the world did nothing decisive, and in March 1935, Germany announced conscription, a peacetime army of half a million men. The new tanks came out into the open. The first Luftwaffe squadrons flew past. The new German Navy was underway. Hitler kept Europe bewildered. Proclaiming Versailles extinct, he proposed a limit on armaments. Britain, the first democracy to make a pact with the Nazis, signed a naval agreement. Hitler was reassured. It might be safe to start tampering with the hated frontiers. One part of Versailles had already been undone. In January 1935, the territory of the Tsar the little coal mining region, which had been German before 1918, voted overwhelmingly and under international supervision to return to Germany.
Next door, the Rhineland remained a demilitarized zone. Beyond dispute, this was part of Germany, but to recover it would directly challenge the Allies, and above all, France. The troops rode over the Rhine bridges at dawn on March the 7th, 1936. Secretly, the commanders were ready to bolt back across the river if France showed any sign of fight, but there was none. The Rhineland city of Cologne and all Germany went wild with relief and delight. A part of German honor had been recovered. Hitler had taken a chance and won. Two years later, Austria, Hitler's birthplace, lay ripe for the taking. Austrian Nazis were rioting for Anschluss, union with Germany. To prevent a plebiscite on independence, Hitler marched in. German troops were greeted by hysterical crowds. Vienna suffered a jubating terror which even Germany had not yet seen. Austria became a province. Germany's neighbors, appalled, uncertain, unprepared, once again did nothing. Czechoslovakia was no lost German province, but an independent nation, allied to Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. Within its northern border lived the Sudeten Germans. Hitler incited this minority, which had never been part of Germany, to demand union with the Reich. Europe prepared for war. But though Czechoslovakia was ready to fight, Britain and France gave way. At Munich in September 1938, Chamberlain for Britain, Italy's Mussolini, De Ladier for France, signed with Hitler the treaty which stripped Czechoslovakia of the Sudetenland and left her broken and abandoned. Germans crossed the border, welcomed as liberators by the Sudeten population. At home, the German generals who opposed Hitler, hoping that a rebuff over Czechoslovakia would fatally injure his prestige, gave up their plots in despair. Hitler sat with his troops in the field and planned ahead. The Sudetenland was easily digested. The next course could be taken fast. The shrunken Czech lands and Slovakia lay helpless before him. He struck on March the 15th, 1939. The German troops reached Prague the same day. There was no resistance. The last democracy in Central Europe was wiped out. The Czechs would never trust the West again. The West trusted Hitler no more and realized at last that only force would stop him. Berlin, more cheers, more worship. Yet what was in the minds of those who cheered? Very few wanted wars of conquest or hoped like Hitler for a German empire from the Urals to the Atlantic. Most thought they were taking back what had been robbed from them and restoring, not destroying, the order and unity of Europe. For these crowds, it seemed that Hitler's statesmanship could never fail. 
Others who stayed at home that night feared a war was coming which might destroy Germany itself. But now they saw no hope for a rising against Hitler. They were left with the moral question, should one resist a tyranny without hope of success? Well, I think it's difficult, first of all, to make up your mind that you should do something against a government. Um, this is very rare, first of all. Secondly, if it is extremely dangerous, as it is in a dictatorship, it's even more complicated because everybody likes his own life. I think everything that came to us when we were living in Germany came very gradually. That was part, perhaps, of the way Hitler managed these things. It came on us rather drip by drip, rather like an anaesthetic, one could almost say. And it was only when a specific thing that he did hit you personally that you actually realized that um, what was going on. Uh, in my particular case, I think I could say that it hit me personally when the Jewish doctor of my children, whom I'd always had, came, he, see, he was a very busy man, but he seemed to be getting, having always more time to spare. And I remember one night he came and spent the night looking after my very sick child. And in the morning, the child was better, and when he left, he said, asked me, did I still want him to look after my children? And I was tired, and I said, well, for goodness sakes, why not? And he told me that his clinic, his children's clinic, which he had started in Hamburg, was going to, he was going to be dismissed, and that he'd had threatening letters that if he laid his hands on Aryan children, he was in for trouble. In November 1938, a Jew, shot a German diplomat in Paris. The Nazi leaders organized a reprisal. Synagogues were burned and Jewish shops looted all over Germany. On that crystal night, named for the smashed glass sparkling in the gutters, thousands of Jews were thrown into concentration camps. Eine schreckliche Nacht. Do you want to know how the night was? If you want to know, I will tell you. We were all shoved together, beaten and punched, and made to stand in ranks and be counted and so on. Because I'd been a soldier, I didn't find that so very difficult. But the others, who didn't fall in properly, they were beaten right away. And the most terrible thing was when somebody grabbed hold of a big, strong man, he said, don't grab me. What? I shouldn't grab you? And he hit him. And this man was immediately overpowered by three people, SS people. A block was brought. He was tied down to it, and the camp commander said, the Jew Israel, or the Jew Idzik, I can't remember exactly now, is sentenced to 25 lashes. Then a huge man came, an SS man with a huge horsewhip and started to beat him. The man just groaned a bit at first, but then he shouted, stop, stop. The commander said, what do you mean, stop? We'll start all over again from the beginning. But after three more lashes, the blood was spurting. Then he stopped and salt was rubbed into the wounds, or pepper, I can't remember. The man was dragged away. We never saw him again. Of course, in the 38, when the um, synagogues were burning, everybody knew what was going on. 
I remember that my brother-in-law, the husband of my sister Lena, uh, was Georg Huber, when he went in the morning after the day of the uh, Kristallnacht, Reichskristallnacht, Crystal Night, or how you say, um, he went by train to his office downtown, and between the stations of Savignyplatz and Zoological Garden, there is the Jewish synagogue, yeah? And he saw that it was burning, yeah? And he murmured, Kulturschande. Yeah, that is a insult for cultured, shame to our culture. Well, right away, a, a gentleman in front of him turned his revere and showed his uh, Parteiabzeichen, bed, party badge, yeah, and took out his papers that he was a man of the Gestapo. And he had to show his papers to give his address and was ordered to come uh, to the party office next morning, nine o'clock. April 1939. The Wehrmacht prepares to celebrate Hitler's 50th birthday. They hope for the usual Führer weather, a fine day. The Führer drives through Berlin, under the Brandenburg Gate and down the Siegesallee, the Avenue of Victories. The army lining his route has increased sevenfold in just four years. Among the Wehrmacht's 51 divisions, the new Panzer units, the instrument of Blitzkrieg. In spite of appearances, the High Command is by no means sure that this army is fit for war yet. Hitler is ready to overrule them. The word in every diplomatic conversation that summer was Danzig. The free city, with its mixed German-Polish population, had been separated from Germany and made the responsibility of a League of Nations commissioner. Danzig and East Prussia were now sundered from the Reich by a strip of Polish territory, the Corridor. Hitler was demanding the return of Danzig and free access to East Prussia across the Corridor. Poland refused. In March 1939, Britain and France guaranteed her frontiers. In August, Britain promised to fight if Poland was attacked. Once again, myths about the persecution of a German minority were used to build up a case for armed intervention. German refugees told piteous tales of Polish brutality. Nazi propaganda filmed them greedily for the cinema newsreels throughout July and August. Hitler's plan was to wipe Poland off the map. But this might mean war with Soviet Russia, and he was not ready for that. His foreign minister, Ribbentrop, flew to Moscow on August the 23rd to sign the Nazi-Soviet Pact. Poland's fate was sealed. The new alliance stunned the unsuspecting West. Germany gloated. 
Der Paktabschluss hat die Einkreisungspolitiker empfindlich getroffen. Außenminister Lord Halifax erklärte, You will have read the report about the agreement reached between Russia and Germany, which has surprised the world. And the life of all nations depends in the last resort on the mutual respect for one another's rights and reasonable confidence that they can each live their life in their own way, I would earnestly hope. Sehr richtig, Herr Halifax. Auch das deutsche Volk will sein Leben auf seine eigene Art leben können. Which cannot be retraced. Reason may yet prevail. The German newsreels tried to show Britain distracted, still uncertain. Minister President Chamberlain verlässt Downing Street. Die englische Diplomatie entfaltet eine fieberhafte Tätigkeit, das Unrecht von Versailles zu verewigen. One young German left England for home. I had a girlfriend whom I wanted to marry and I uh, said to myself, well, I'll dare go home. When I came to Cologne, I read the first German newspapers. And I knew at once uh, there was great danger of a war now. The tone of the German press was absolutely hysterical. Uh, and uh, I, I thought, what a fool I was. <laughs> I had just gone home in that moment. <laughs> All over Europe, the reservists got their telegrams. In the last hours of peace, the soldiers put on uniform with a tired grin.